Okay, thank you everybody for coming to this talk today. My name is Samira al Qasim. I'm the Program and Communications Manager here. And um, we're very happy to have with us Moan Aude. And thank you, Fakira, for bringing him to us. Um, the talk today is entitled Living in Limbo, East Jerusalem's Neighborhoods Behind the Separation Barrier. Um, our speaker, Mr. Oda, is an attorney at law and a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. We're very happy to have him with us. So his talk today will focus on East Jerusalem neighborhoods behind the separation barrier where approximately 120,000 Palestinians reside. In these neighborhoods, the Palestinian Authority is not allowed to work because they are part of quote unquote Jerusalem. Although located within the Jerusalem municipal boundaries, these neighborhoods receive almost no service from the Israeli authorities in the form of garbage disposal, functional road infrastructure, or sufficient water supply. This creates living conditions that would be unacceptable anywhere else. In other words, the Palestinian neighborhoods beyond the separation barrier present in an extreme form the broader processes that have taken place in East Jerusalem and Israel's attitude toward the Palestinian population in the city. Israel, Israeli policy in these neighborhoods has destabilized Palestinians' physical and symbolic linkage um, and belonging to their home city of Jerusalem. The separation barrier has restricted their actions and their physical, social, economic, cultural, and political existence, pushing tens of thousands of them into the neighborhoods beyond the wall, effectively displacing them from the city. Um, we've had other events here that talk about the mobility of Palestinians and how it has been curtailed in a number of ways, including also in the imaginary. So if you're interested in, in pursuing this subject more, what we've covered on it, just go to our website, videos and transcripts. So our speaker today, Moan Ode, is a member of El Shabaka, the Palest Palestinian Policy Network, and he has an LLM degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He is currently participating in a Leaders for Democracy Fellowship with the Department of State and is a researcher, as mentioned, at the Woodrow Wilson in International Center for Scholars. In Jerusalem, Ode serves as a human security officer at the representative office of Switzerland to the Palestinian Authority and is the founder and managing partner of Ode Advocates, which works on human rights cases and class actions. He also volunteers as a legal manager for Northern East Jerusalem Residents Committee's legal clinic, where he represents individual and public interest human rights cases and volunteers as an international humanitarian law coordinator in the Association for the Promotion of International Humanitarian Law. Lastly, Oda is a member of the Young Legal Leaders Group of the International Bar Association dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So thank you, Moan Oda. We would like to now hear your talk. Please welcome him. Thank you everyone for coming for this. Uh, I'll try to give you a different approach of Jerusalem, more than the one that we used to have, or used, you used to have about Jerusalem. So first of all, I will just, the area, okay, because I need to go to there just for a second. The areas that we will speak about is this, these two areas. Now, this is the green line. But before starting to speak about the areas, I'll try to give you kind of background about what happened so you will understand what really, why the situation now in these areas are that bad or that uh, critical. So we'll start to speak about the annexation. As many of you know for sure, two weeks after 1967 war, Israel annexed East Jerusalem. But many 
doesn't really know that it didn't really annex only the Jordanian East Jerusalem. No, because there was the Jordanian East Jerusalem, which is a small area, the old city and some areas around. But Israel added about 60 square kilometers, 28 villages that used to be part of West Bank to be Jerusalem. They added it to Jerusalem and announced that this is our capital, Jerusalem. So they added many areas with many uh, Palestinian people who were get the, the, the residency of Israel. So what happened actually that Israel annexed the land but not the people. How is that? The pe like, as you know, in 1948, when Israel was established, the Palestinians who stayed there, they got the Israeli citizenship. But in 67, when Israel annexed East Jerusalem, they didn't give the Israeli citizenship to the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem. No, they gave them kind of residency right. And we will speak more about it uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. But, and this was the first, the first step to, towards making Jerusalem as the, the, the capital of Israel. What happened after the annexation, almost through the years, almost a third of the area of East Jerusalem were uh, announced as public open area, green area, what's called green area, and nobody can build in it, nobody can use it for, for building. Also Israel made or built different neighborhood, Jewish neighborhoods inside East Jerusalem itself, Pisgatzi A, for example, for those who lived or you know uh, Jerusalem or other places, which is ex they exist in East Jerusalem itself. All of this led that the Palestinians have a very limited land place and space to build and to develop themselves. And it's not uh, a secret that many uh, officials, Israeli officials, announced publicly that we are interested in more land, less Arabs. And that was clearly by many uh, deputy, for example, the, the, the deputy of the mayor of Jerusalem in 2014 said it twice. This, the, the mayor himself, different times, he gave statements saying that our borders as Jerusalem is the, the, is the barrier itself, which is proving again and again that there's kind of interest to push more and more Palestinians outside of Jerusalem itself. So Israel did different <coughs> policies since 67 to, to ensure the, the Jewish majority and to make Jerusalem as a, an Israeli city and to claim internationally because as you all know that the international community did not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel until now. Nobody recognized East Jerusalem as part of Israel. But they are working and trying to make it an Israeli city so they can change facts on the ground and make it easier in the future to prevent any two-state solution or at, at least to make Jerusalem as the, the capital of Israel that can be changed. So they did different things and we said uh, annexation and confiscations. They annexed the area, confiscated many parts of the, of the land, gave it to public areas, open uh, like parks. You can imagine that people that don't have a place to live, but they have a park. Okay. Uh, all of this was in purpose to limit the land. The second thing that was is the ensuring the Jewish majority. In the 70s, the, the Israeli officials thought that it would be okay to have 76% of Jews and 24, 25% of Arabs, like it could be 100%. Don't quote, like, follow me with the numbers exactly. But it was like three fourths and, and a fourth of Arabs and non Arabs, or Jews and non Jews. But what happened uh, in 2014, now it's like we are speaking about 37% of the residents are Arabs now in, in East Jerusalem, including the people outside the very woods inside. Uh, the, like the Jerusalem boundary, but outside the boundary. We are speaking about more than the third of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem residents, and most probably in a few years, maybe the Arabs will become something like 40% of the, of, of 
Jerusalem in, in total, like which will make Jerusalem uh, a bil bi bilateral. Bilateral. Okay. I will hear me or should I speak with that? Okay. It's easier for me to speak here. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, so we are like it looks like it will be about forty percent of the people will be Arab, which will make Jerusalem as a bilateral city and will be very hard to the Israeli authorities to claim that Jerusalem is, is a total Israeli Jewish city and to make the claim that it's the, the capital of Israel. So, and that pushed the, the authorities to think about different policies, how to increase the Jewish numbers and decrease the Arab numbers. Uh, one of the biggest issues related to the to the building to the, uh, related to the lands was to non register the land what happened when israel entered the the east jerusalem controlled east jerusalem occupied east jerusalem they froze any kind of registering lands it did also in the west bank in area c anyone who's following it, what's happening in area c knows that in area c is in the west bank which is 62% of the West Bank, uh, there's no registered land. Nobody can claim uh, ownership. They can, but they can't prove it very well. So they freeze it totally. Nothing was registered. Nowadays, half, almost half of East Jerusalem lands are totally not registered anywhere. They are not registered. Nobody really could register them because of the Israeli policies. And because of this, again, it's kind of circle. Any time that you should ask, if you are interested to build a house, you should prove, first of all, ownership to your land, like where you are building your house. I would say on my land. OK, how to prove that this is your land? It will be a big story, a very costly story. Uh, in some areas, you still can register the land, very limited neighborhoods, but this will be extremely, extremely expensive. While in other places in Israel, it's, it's made by the authorities themselves. Like, there's no need to, to pay anything. As a, as a citizen, as a resident, you go and you know already where's your borders, is, this, is it registered or not, and you will just buy it, sell it, do what any owner could do for his or her land. So this was one of the policies, I will just try to skip it very fast, but to tell you why we will reach to the point of uh, uh, neighborhoods behind the wall. So the other th thing was freezing the planning also. In East Jerusalem, in whole East Jerusalem, there's no public, out, like there's no even one freeze uh, zoning plan. There's no plan there. There's, in some areas, we have some plans, planning zones or something, but a total in East Jerusalem, there's no such a plan. And nowadays, there's only 20%, only 20% of East Jerusalem lands are, there's plans there. In the 80%, there's nothing, and without a plan for sure. Even if you could prove ownership, which is very hard, you will not be able to build because there's no plan. That was also uh, another one. The third policy or the fourth policy is the resident themselves. What happened was that, can I move a little, it's just easier for me to just, I can't stop. Uh, that Israel actually, as I said, annexed the land, not the people. They gave the people the, the right of residence. At that point, nobody really understood what's really going on, why they uh, got this, but it, in the, like, Years and years, we, we are discovering what happened. So they, they were citizens of Jordan, like, let's say. They were Palestinians. Then, for eight war, Jordan took the uh, control in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, Egypt took control on, on uh, Gaza. And the, the Palestinians in West Bank and East Jerusalem became Jordanians, some uh, citizens. So. When Israel came and controlled and occupied the East Jerusalem, they, they, instead of being again a citizen of Israel, the new, the new entity, the new uh, country, they got the residence right. What is the difference between residence right and citizenship right? So, first of 
first of all, resistance rise is ve very easy to lose. You can lose it. There's, according to the Israeli regulations, there's two main reasons to lose your uh, residency right. Or to, 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 to move outside of Israel, outside of uh, Jerusalem for seven years. If I move to outside of the boundaries for more than seven years, I will lose it. If I got a, a green card, for example, if I moved to the US and got a green card, I will lose also my residence right. And if I got oh, uh, a citizenship, a foreigner uh, citizenship, European, Canadian, American, any kind of citizenship, also you will lose your residency right, which will make it easier for the authorities to revoke the residency right for different people who moved outside of Jerusalem for different reasons, family, uh, work, uh, study, and anyway. Then, until that, but until then, the, the, the legal, you could say, the legal picture or the legal uh, uh, right of, of residency was it very clear until the case, very, and, and, uh, uh, a famous case in the Israeli Supreme Court called Mubarak, Awad Mubarak here. Awad Mubarak was a Palestinian who was born in Jerusalem and moved to the U.S. He got the Israeli, uh, the, uh, sorry, the American uh, citizenship, and then he moved back in the 88 to Jerusalem. He was kind of political active, and uh, Israel decided that to revoke his residency because he is he has a, a, a foreign uh, citizenship. Israeli citizenship. Then the case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that the residency right is similar to the immigrant's right, like the uh, President Justice uh, 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 Aharon Barak at that time, one of the biggest Israeli and most respectful uh, justices people in Israeli period. I, myself, I respect him too much, but he, like in this case, he tried to find a solution for this, and he said that, unfortunately, he tried to find a way to say to revoke the, revoke the the residency of this guy exactly. But what happened, as you know, it was a precedent that the authorities used it to revoke residencies for thousands of hours. Until today, based on this uh, precedent, about fifteen thousand people lost their residency right in in, in uh, from Jerusalem. The biggest was in, and and surprisingly, most of the revoking the, the the residency right was in 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 Oslo time or in negotiation times. Like you could see that at one point the, the Israeli authorities is working on negotiation, but on the other side they are working to revoke residencies and to to play like to change facts on the ground itself to make Jerusalem undivided at all. So the and the third thing was moving from immigrants to to displaced people. That because you are losing your residency right and you are immigrant, so you have to move outside of Jerusalem to the West Bank, to Jordan, to go back to the U.S. It's your decision where to go, but you will lose your residency right. So all of this is a battle, a big battle for Jerusalem uh, residents who is. Ha like they have, they don't have a place to stay, but they have to stay in Jerusalem. Like it's too, too. Ish they have to stay in Jerusalem because otherwise they will lose their residency right, and they will not be able to vi visit Jerusalem or live in Jerusalem. The second thing that they can't live in Jerusalem because it's yeah, they can't build. They can't build. They have to live, and then. Then there was the decision to build the barrier, the wall. The decision to build the wall is, was not in the in the 2000. Like it, it's a, it's an old idea, uh, idea that in the old 80s, early uh, 90s, that the idea to build in the first intifada that the Israeli authorities thought that this is the a good way to to separate Israel from the Palestinians, but. The, the high point was after the collapse of Camp David and Saba talks, and that all the second intifada, the Aqsa intifada breakout, and many 
uh, attacks on Israel, uh, many bombs in the Israeli street, and that ex accelerates the decision to build the barrier and to separate the West Bank from the Palest from uh, Israel. And usually, the the only the only reason was usually the only justification for why you are building the, the barrier, why you are building the wall, usually it was for security reasons. And the thing, and, uh, what they did also was, sorry. As I said, it used to be also the security. Then there was the policy usually in the 90s mainly that from one on the one track, they are going to negotiation. On the on the ground, they are changing facts, and and this, like many people are following, you could find that even the uh, Yitzhak Rabin and his well, how do you talk to Abu Dhabi, like party? Okay. The Labour Party, who used to be the, the 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 people behind the the peace process, are the same people who revoked the most residency rights. Like sometimes it's not the the, ref, the right wing who doing doing so. No, it's sometimes it's the, the other side who who's shown as like okay, we are going to no who's who's revoking more uh, residency rights and pushing for uh, land issues more. One of the issues were also to to prove that Jerusalem is an Israeli city was to make it gr to uh, the the idea of Great Jerusalem, Great Ju or Greater Jerusalem was to the idea to include more set, like two big settlements, Ma'ale uh, Adumim and Bizgat the Ape, I think the name, which has the biggest number of of people to include inside Jerusalem to ensure again that Jerusalem is getting more uh, Jewish majority because many, many secular uh, Jewish are trying to move outside of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is not the best place to live in. So this is the situation until they built the barrier. So this is again like it's a picture. Of, you could see that this is the barrier. This is how many people living here. So until 2004, 2005, when, when the Israeli army and the Israeli Ministry of Defense decided to be, or built it, actually, the neighborhood behind the barrier, which now called Kufar Aqab, used to be a, a nice place to live, even one of the best places in East Jerusalem to live. It used to be a, an expensive area, upper middle class, those are the only one who could live there without, uh, it was not crowded at all. Nobody, like most of the people used to live close to the old city or the villages around the co old city. Uh, I'll try to show you what's happening now before, although I will speak about the, uh, the, what happened and then we'll show you some, some video about it. So after building the, the the wall, what's happened actually that some contractors understood somehow that they can build in the area without a problem. They can start building their big, tall, unsafe buildings with a very cheap uh, prices and sell it to the Palestinians who's dying to have a place to stay in Jerusalem. And that's what happened. Actually, building the barrier caused two waves of immigrants. The first one was that when they built the barrier itself, many of the middle upper class who used to live outside the, the like in the area itself, and because they are in the economical situation that allowed them to go in, they moved in. But there was a couple of hundred. On the other side, because building all of these apartments, the cheap price, and uh, very high prices inside the barrier itself, because directly after after building the barrier itself, the prices jumped like 
two, three hundred percent ones. Like in areas like Beit Hanina, I will show you maybe. Inside Jerusalem, like this is, this is Beit Hanina. Beit Hanina now. To get a house or an apartment will cost you about four hundred thousand dollars. Why to have a, a house outside the barrier will cost you about fourth of it, like one hundred thousand dollars. So many people, young couple, others can't afford to to live inside. And even if you have, even if you have half a million dollars to buy an apartment. The number of apartments is very, very, very limited, which is pushing, like, again, it's, it's not something that you can afford. And if, even if you can afford it, it's not sure that you will be able to find a place to live. That made the, the push many, many, many people to live outside, thinking that it will be easy to go in and out and to, to get to continue working in Jerusalem without a problem, and that will, even because you will still live inside Jerusalem, theoretically, you will keep your residency right. So you are getting a cheap house, and you are keeping your residency right. So, and that pushed hundreds of people to live in, the, in that very small area, and that put a lot of pressure on the infrastructure and destroyed it totally. I will just show you a, if, if, if Samir can help me just with this. Okay. Okay. Magic. Ahyanan, we have a the غلاء فاحش لأسعار الأراضي وتراخيص البناء داخل مدينة القدس جعل البنايات العالية والمتراصة تتكاثر بجنون وبدون رقيب حيث لم تسمح بلدية الاحتلال بالبناء سوى على ثلاثة بالمئة من أراضي القدس المحتلة منذ عام 1967 90% بالمئة من المباني فيش فيها ترخيص ومع ذلك بدفع ضريبة أرنونا وما فيش خدمات بلدية القدس تأخذ ضريبة من البيت المرخص وغير المرخص يعني هي رضيانة أن هذا البيت غير المرخص هي رضيانة وإحنا في منطقتنا إحنا بحاجة لهذه الأبنية هنا بين أكوام النفايات والأحياء المكتظة يلهو هؤلاء الصغار تسعون بالمئة من أطفال المنطقة أصيبوا بأمراض الرئة خمسة وثلاثون بالمئة منهم تعرضوا لأمراض جلدية نتيجة تجمع النفايات أو حرقها ووسط هذا كله يبحثون عن متنفس صغير أو فسحة يشيدون فيها أحلامهم ولا مناص لا ملعب ولا ناد ولا حتى مواقف للسيارات في منطقة يربو عدد سكانها على ستين ألفا تمتص حكومة الاحتلال أموالهم بالضرائب بينما تبخل عليهم بأبسط الخدمات مش ملعب والملعب اللي كنا نلعب فيه هدو أنا حابة أنه عندي يكون في ملعب أروح ألعب فيه سيارة قمامة واحدة لأربعة أحياء مكتظة تمتلئ أزقتها بنفايات منتظرة وعودا بالتغلب على هذه الظاهرة بحلول مرحلية ليس أفضلها استخدام حاويات أكبر في الشوارع التي تتسع لذلك يعني أقل ما فيها إحنا بنطلب إنه بس هالزبايل هذا اللي باب الدور واللي بكبوها ونعمل أي شيء إنه محدش يكب هون زبايل حط حاوية يجوا إذا حطينا حاوية إنه تيجي حد يأخذها مش يصير زبالة أكتر من الحاوية ده يرمضور هذا ما بيحصل من شو بالشوارع في طريقك إلى القدس تتعثر بغابة إسمنتية تمتد على طول شارع رام الله القدس ربما تسنح لك الفرصة بالتمعن بأكوام النفايات خلال أزمة السير المعتادة هذا إذا لم يقطع حبل أفكارك رقصة الحافلة على إيقاع حفر الشارع هذه المعاناة وهذا الثمن هذا هو التفرقة العنصرية هذا هو الإحلال يا أختي والاحتلال هذا هو تفريغ القدس من الناس هنا شمالي القدس يحتار السكان أي بلواهم قد تكون أعظم ما بين فكي التهميش وسياسات الاحتلال العنصرية
لوكالة وفاء سلسبيل أبو ميالة من مدينة القدس Things that people in other places like if you if I told somebody here that people are fighting and killing each other just because of garbage, some people will say, "Are you serious?" Like to find a part for your car is a big big story. To to cross the road itself is a big story because there's no crossing. So they they spoke about the bad uh, services. But they mentioned a very interesting and important thing that people there are paying their taxes. Well, legally there's no connection between <coughs> paying tax and getting services. It's two different issues. You can pay your tax and then ask for the service or the opposite. You can, you should get your tax, like the authorities should give you the, the, the service with that and then they should sue you for the taxes. Two different issues. So the big story was that at that point, until now we have it, that we don't have, nobody at least officially has the number, how many people living inside these areas. We don't know, I don't know personally. Like we have an estimation, but not an official estimation. The Minister of Interior, the same, they said, we don't know. The municipality said, we don't know. So who knows, nobody knows. So we tried to find a solution. This, uh, like before submitting, I'll tell you some about some cases that we worked in, but before submitting uh, a case, we asked for the number of, of units inside these areas, because everyone who's living there, in, in order to prove that he's living or she's living in Jerusalem, should pay a tax called Arnon. And in order to pay this tax, he or she should register his unit in the municipality. So we said, let's try to get the number of units registered in these areas and to multiply it off of uh, uh, average number of, of family, uh, family. So we could have, a, 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 we got this. We, I have it for, if, if you want to have it. Like They said, it's like this. This is Kufar Asad, when we spoke up. And this is an official number, it's not that I am, but this was we got through the a request from the, the municipality. The blue, the blue wire is the barrier itself. This is called Kufar Aqab, and this is Shafat refugee camp. This is the area where we also have the same problem. So we found out that this was until 2014, until the end of 2014, which is now for sure it's much more bigger, but there was 6,460 units in Kufar Aqab area and something like 6,760 units in Shafat refugee camp, which makes them together about 13,000 13, units. If you multiply them with seven, which is the average, by the way, when you are speaking about unit here, it does not mean a house. Sometimes it's a whole building with 30 or 40 apartments will be called a unit. But even if we will say that it's a, it's a, it's a, a house, it's an apartment, we are speaking about 13,000 uh, apartments. If we multiply them with seven, for example, the, usually the Arab families are big families you will reach to, to about 100,000 people. The authorities is claiming that there's less, less than about two, like 20,000 people living in both areas. So that was one of our proofs in the court itself that saying that you yourself have this number. So it's not we that we brought the numbers, it's that you, you have the number. And still, you, you don't are, You are not allowing people 
to, you are not giving people the, the enough services that they should have. So what caused the, the, the problem? First of all, the neglection for sure. They left the area. They <coughs> never, they never built, allowed people to build inside. They built the, the barrier itself. But then they allowed people to build without, without limitation in that area. If you go there, anybody will visit there, will notice that very tall, unsafe buildings, one beside the other, as we saw, it's like the, di the distance between them is enough only to walk. It's not even for a car to pass through. They never ask the people, hey, come, what are you doing? Is this your land or not? There's many uh, criminal issues there going because people will come, gangs will control areas. I know people that they're American, Palestinian Americans. They used to have land that in that area. For sure, they don't know where, where it is now because it's not registered. But they know that they used to know that they have a place and land. And that gang came, built, and that's it. People will come and buy because they don't have a, a land B. They have to live there. There's nothing other that they can do. They have to live there. And that caused that thousands and thousands and thousands more people living in a miserable life. By the way, one small earthquake could cause a huge disaster there. I believe, like, you know, keep speaking about an earthquake that will hit Jerusalem. I know in 10, day, 10 years or something like this. And this area will, hopefully not, but I hope that one day you will not ne ever hear that in Kufur Aqab area, thousands of people were buried inside their houses because of what's really happening. Because it's not only that they built on a trespassed land. No, they, the, the quality of building is very bad itself and nobody is checking and nobody is, 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 is uh, following the case. And for the people, they don't have a choice. Again, I'm not that the people that are choosing to live there. No, they have two choices, or to live in the street or to live there. So they choose to live there. This is the only cho chance for the, the only option for them. So this pushed more and more for this situation. Again, the, the municipality, because of its mayor and because of his uh, political dreams, anyone living in, 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 in Israel, Fakhir <coughs> Adida will know that near Barakat, the mayor having some dreams to become the prime minister, and he's using Jerusalem to prove his, that he's a strong guy and he can control the area. So he will not give services to those Arabs living outside of, of barrier. Because this will show them, give them the, 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 the picture of a tough guy who we can trust in the future to be our prime minister. Our, as like an Israeli prime minister. I will speak to you also about not also, also, only the services. What's happened also that, <coughs> After building the barrier, nobody is giving any kind of, there's no one police station, nothing. There's no one hospital, nothing. There's no one uh, emergency places, fire department, nothing. You could understand that this encouraged many criminal gangs to walk there. They are feeling very free. There's no, the Palestinian authority is not working because they are not uh, allowed. And maybe they are not interested even, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the Israeli authorities is not caring about the area at all. It's, uh, as they call it, the area, like area X, that no, the wide west, nobody's really caring about the area. So it, it became like many unlawful Activities is, is taking part there because it's, it's a good place because nobody is, 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 is controlling us. You can do whatever you want. Who will care about what's happening? The, the other point is, is the checkpoint. When the Minister of Defense decided to build the, the barrier, there was for sure petition to the Supreme Court and many issues. In the hearing, the, the Minister of Defense obligated that the waiting time 
for the people who's living, who will live in, in, in Kufur Aqab area or in Sha'afat Rishid camp will not be more than 15 minutes. Like the waiting time at the checkpoint will be 15 minutes. What's really happening now is that the waiting time is above 90 minutes. Like it's about an hour and a half. Why is that? Because there's tens of thousands of vehicles going in and out. The infrastructure is very bad, very narrow, very small. Again, in, in the, behind the walls, it's a no man's land, so people can't, even you could imagine that one crazy guy decided to go in a bad way, like to cross the, everyone. He can stop everything. Because, and, and it will be a fight and a strong story, and that will stuck the people more and more. So the checkpoint is also one of the biggest issues to prevent a kind of preventing, like theoretically, East Jerusalem residents outside the area can go easily to, to Jerusalem. What's happening on the ground, it's a total different story. And it's a total different story between what I am telling you now and to, like you can imagine that you are, you have, you are living about 10 minutes from, you, from your work, but every day you have to drive about one and a half hour this way and one half, like three hours a day, you are s sitting in your car just to pass the checkpoint both say. Now, if you will ask the, the army, who will, they will say, no, they, like we, we are checking fast. Well, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It depends on the mood of the, the soldier. But even in the best mood of the soldiers, it's still very bad because the infrastructure is very bad. And there's tens of thousands of vehicles going in and out. So even if the soldier will ask people just go without checking them, this will take them about 45 minutes without even asking. But in most of the cases, they do check. And sometimes they che the check will take one to two minutes. And you can imagine if you have only 50 cars behind you, everyone will take one minute. It's, it's an hour. So this is one of the biggest problems for the, the areas. But Still, many people will keep living there because they don't have a choice. They don't have other choices. So this is a picture. This is very close to the main, it's called Qalandia checkpoint. You could see that. It's not a very rainy, like this is what's happening every rainy day. It's not uh, flooded or something. This is what's happening every rainy day. It's enough to, like, if, if it was raining like today in DC, if the rain today was in Jerusalem, in that area, that was what will happen. Very bad infrastructure, very bad uh, situation. You could imagine that you want just to cross from here to here, what will happen to you? If you have a child, if a pregnant woman, an old man, this is the situation. So what we decided to do, like we, 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 uh, established an, a legal clinic in the area and we tried to help somehow and to to attack the policies there so we did two cases the first case was in 2012 against the garbage the municipality uh, budget for garbage in whole Jerusalem is about 300 million shekels which is like divided by four almost, like uh, like 70 million shekels, uh, dollars almost, plus minus, let's say, maybe more. But what they used to give these areas of outside of Jerusalem, which is about 12.5% of the residents, is only 2 million shekels, which is less than half a million dollars. You can, 70 million dollars, and that area getting only f half a million dollars. The situation is still bad. I'm not saying that we improved it that much, but we succeeded to improve it somehow. The other one, I will tell you about the other one both because the, 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 the authorities' arguments are almost the, the same every time. The infrastructure cases, each, uh, Jerusalem's municipality budget is 800 million shekels for streets which is about $200 million. Kufur Aqab and uh, Shafat refugee camp, they got only 
hundred thousand shekels, which is two hundred thousand dollars, like two hundred million, and they got two hundred thousand, which is less than one zero point zero zero one percent of the budget. So usually, what they used to say is two big claims. This is the only claim that the authorities, that the municipality used to to use. First one is money. We don't have money. Sorry. We know we are obligated to do so, but we don't have money. The second one is the security. What they are saying that the situation in these areas are very dangerous for our workers, who is usually Arab, Palestinians, some of them living in the area itself. Like It's dangerous for them when they are uh, workers, but it's not dangerous when they are uh, like after the war. So in the first case, we succeeded to increase the, the budget by 30%. That was an agreement to increase it by 30%. That was in 2012. Today, it's not enough. I think there's a need to go back again to the court and to push for another. This is the problem for the people. For every single thing, they should go to the court and ask for to collect the garbage from my uh, area. like. This put more and more pressure on the people themselves to show that, to, to, like, what they should do to do, so, like, more than this. So this is was the case. In the other case, and that was the president, for the first time, we started to have a decision. Because on the garbage case, it was a, a settlement between us and the, the, the authorities. They used the same claims, but they said, they requested the state to join, like the state of Israel to join, because they said, we didn't build the barrier. The Minister of Defense built the barrier, and they should be in the court to defend themselves. We agreed, and we said, yeah, you should come. Let's find a final solution. We can't keep. Very inter interestingly, the response of the state was totally against the, the municipality itself. They claim that we gave you the money, like the state of Israel said, we gave Jerusalem municipality money. We gave you $500 million to invest in East Jerusalem. You still have half of this number, uh, half of this amount aside. You never touched it. And you are coming and saying, I, as a state, should give you money. Like you have 250 million shekels aside, and you are asking me to give you more money. Like what is the logic? And this is proof again that Somebody in the municipality itself is trying not to let the things move on. Some, like He's using the issue as, again, for his or for her political dreams at one. The other thing was that the army even said that you never asked for any coordination for us as army, the Israeli army said. You never, for the, for the municipality said, you never asked for any kind of of coordination with us, even if it's not secure. We can come and, and join you, which is very problematic. This is a different story. But this is proof again and again that the, the municipality itself was never interested even to go to the army and ask, even to show that we are interested to push and to work there. They never did so. In that case, the court decided that that's it. It's Jerusalem or not. If it's Jerusalem, you should work and you have to work. And if not, you should decide that it's not, and then the people will deal with it. And they said, couldn't for sure couldn't say no, because it's very, very, it's 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 very hard. Like changing the boundaries now of Jerusalem, like the the blue line itself. The blue to change it, you need now. A basic law. It's kind of, Israel doesn't have a constitution. It has a, a basic law. And to change the, the Jerusalem boundaries now, Jerusalem uh, municipal areas, you need to change a basic law of Jerusalem itself. And that will take a majority of Knesset members. And that will be very, very hard. So the situation is really bad. And maybe we are speaking like it's like a story, but it's people lost life. The problem with this area that because of it, it is Jerusalem, many 
European government, even the US, are not interested to go in that area in, in Jerusalem. They're trying, okay, we will invest in the West Bank, Area C, we will do something, but in, in, in Jerusalem itself, it's because it's very sensitive, it's very, like, people trying always just to, to, to be away from Jerusalem. So these areas are getting nothing from nobody. Thank you, my colleague Moeen. I uh, really appreciate it to have your voice here in the United States of America, and I hope that to this to be spread also in the universities. I like that we have, uh, and we are proud of the old men and women, but I want youth also to be a lot in other places. So um, I think that, no, Israel, they, they are taking care of this area, this policy. They are using this policy in order to empty the land, they are, yes, as you said, they want it to be, uh, because there is no infrastructure, this is a purpose, I think the care of this area, they want to, emplace, to make it empty from the Arabs, and to be full of Jewish, to, in order to be capital of Israel. What they are doing, <coughs> uh, and they are exploiting, I think, that the peace process, because what are the, are the negotiations on, just on media, while on the ground there is uh, changing the facts, uh, in the West Bank, the settlements uh, confiscated and eat the land. In Jerusalem, the same thing. So, um, and I don't know, the, there is nowadays even, there are even the, some the, uh, Americans, um, the analysis, analytical persons, they said that even the, the two states uh, nowadays, it's somehow, it's, it's this idea, it's, it's killing this idea about the, the, this, the, the two state solutions. And and then, for example, I am a Palestinian refugee living in Lebanon, and I saw that we are living in a miserable uh, situation in, in, in uh, camps. And I thank you very well that now I understand very well what is going on in Jerusalem. So just, I have no question, but I hope that you to continue, and I support you to everywhere to raise you, the Jerusalem people voice and the Palestinian voice thank in order to reach our uh, justice and our solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. So one thing. not from my perspective. It's not to, to empty this, exactly this area. No, it's maybe to empty this area, but not to. They're pushing more people to live there. So at one point, there will, maybe it will be a decision to leave this area and say, okay, we have like 200,000 Palestinians living there. They are not part of Jerusalem. That's it. In one, in one second, Jerusalem empty of 2,000, 200,000, sorry, uh, Palestinians, Arab Palestinians of Jerusalem. So the idea will be, yes, it's not to empty exactly, maybe to empty the other areas, but exactly the areas, no, just to, to even to put more and more. And this is the reason why they are not hiding eyes on these big, very huge uh, buildings, like, like inside Jerusalem, if you built a, a small room second day the inspectors will come and check what's happening but here building and building and building nobody's checking on them uh, thank you Maeen thank you for this presentation uh, I'm Ahmed from Jordan I would ask about um, uh, as we hear all uh, that uh, president-elect uh, Trump he promised uh, the Jewish groups here to move the uh, uh, U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to, uh, to Jerusalem. My question about what is the impact of this uh, step, if it's happened in the future. Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, he promised not the Jewish people because the Jews will not, they did not support him at, at the beginning. I was speaking with Brian yesterday about this issue, and maybe he, he has better than understanding on this than me. But I understood that, first of all, the president-elect doesn't have the power even to, to move the embassy. There's no such, he's just claiming that he can do it, but he cannot, right? Basically, yeah. Basically, yeah. And, yeah, like, uh, 
cannot. So um, the, the president can uh, tell the State Department that he would like the, 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 the embassy moved, but um, it, moving an embassy is a very, 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 very long process. Uh, it requires years of negotiations with the host government. Um, it depends on, on what the host government wants to institute. As an example, um, in Vietnam, uh, we have, in, in Hanoi, we have an embassy that is in terrible condition. It's rat infested, it's roach infested, the ceilings are falling in. We've been in that, and, and we've known for 20 years that we need to move out of that building and into something else. And perhaps next year, the Vietnamese government might let us start to look for a new site for our building. And that's after 20 years of negotiations and fights and promises and such. Um, so that is five presidential administrations that, that, that have, I mean, it's, I guess we've only had three presidents in that time, but it's five administrations worth of terms. And, um, and so to, to get something like that moving takes a lot, a lot of time. Um, now, admittedly, if, if, uh, if Israel does want to get more legitimacy for the capital, they will be highly motivated but it still takes years of negotiations between the State Department and the Israeli MFA, uh, and then finding a site, and then the, yeah. the State Department uh, agreeing to build something, <laughs> and then actually building a thing. It, it's still, it, you're, you're looking at f 10 years at a minimum <laughs> before, this, before Jerusalem is where the embassy would be, I think. I, th I think this, this young man's had his hand <laughs> up. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Moin. I had a couple questions about these two yeah. particular neighborhoods. Yeah. The first question is when, I know you're not a spokesman for the Israeli government, but when they built the wall, why did they do that to these two particular neighborhoods and not other Jerusalem neighborhoods? Was it this? Uh, nefarious plan you just described of hoping to force other Jerusalemites to relocate to that neighborhood or were there other reasons? Second question, maybe it would help your audience if you could indicate whether where residents of these two neighborhoods need to cross, which checkpoints when they need to get into the rest of Jerusalem. I see Kalandia is right next to Kufur Aqab, but the folks in Shuafat, how do they, where do they cross to get, what, which checkpoint do they use? And then my final question, these, the people who live in these neighborhoods have exactly the same Jerusalem IDs as other Jerusalemites. So in theory, yes or no, and in theory, they could, if they had the money, uh, they could pick up and move somewhere else right. they, in Jerusalem if they wanted. It's really that it's just impossible because of the cost and the lack of housing elsewhere, correct? Right. about why they're building the, the, the wall, the, the only reason was is the, the security. But very interesting, in, in this situation, when the National Security Council explained why there's an interest to build the, the wall here, that was two reasons. The first was the security, as usual, and the other one was the Israeli interest. There was an Israeli interest like they never said that, but oh, this is publicly, it's not like something. There's an Israeli interest to build the wall in this area, to divide this, this area. Like it was publicly said that to keep the Israeli interest in Jerusalem, we are building 
this area and to keep Israel safe. All the opposite, keep Israel safe, and, uh, but it's both is. So why they decided here, by the way, like anybody who's knowing the roads very well here, the road here is connecting the west and the north of, uh, sorry, the south and north of the west bank. So it's, you don't need more than five soldiers to close the whole west bank. You don't need a, a big army. You need only one tank with three soldiers and you can totally disconnect the, the west bank between just for, to close this street. Uh, yeah, so they actually, as you said, they can move. They have the same uh, ID, but the reason why they moved because they couldn't afford it to stay in. So they moved to the, and it's harder to move back again now. Hopefully I, I answered. Thank you uh, very much. <clears throat> I have a somewhat different uh, take on the move, possible move of the embassy to East Jerusalem. Uh, it really could be done quite quickly. The Israelis could empty a hotel and provide that as an embassy. And, you know, it's in their interest to move as quickly as possible. The impediment is actually international law because moving the embassy to East Jerusalem would be recognition of some kind of Israeli annexation of a city uh, whose status remains to be determined under UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, furthermore, there is the question of uh, the reaction, not only in, the, uh, in Jerusalem and the Palestinian occupied territories, the rest of the occupied territories, but in the Muslim world in general. Uh, I think it, uh, you know, the, the results would be politically, could be politically catastrophic. So uh, for that reason, I think there, those two reasons, I don't think there will be quick movement on uh, an embassy to East Jerusalem. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your scholarship and the knowledge and the experience firsthand, which has gone into your lecture today. However, in another realm, entirely as complex, but very different and not political, International Habitat for Humanity has worked very successfully to create dialogue as an outside party. And this year, what you brought up might be the very instrument through which environmental concern and environmental money investment purposes may provide an opportunity to come afresh into the subject of Jerusalem as a city. And also the previous megacity strategy may be presented for the first time on behalf of the people in dialogue, all people who are now residents and have rights and interests in Jerusalem may be newly addressed. told me it was many people from different agencies, UN agencies, I mean, it's, it's always very diff difficult for them to work in Jerusalem, particularly, in, it's always very hard to work in Jerusalem. It's very sensitive. F very sensitive to Israel, very sensitive, sensitive to the Palestinians, so they are trying always to be, not to, to, to work there because it's safer for them not to do so. Like they, as I said, they will invest in, in, in other places in the West Bank, Area peace mainly, but not. They are trying not to work in, in, in Jerusalem. In, in, in general. Is it possible, Mr. Netanyahu's uh, family was involved in a desalination uh, water project, and there was suggestion or uh, rumor of corruption, and so for some reasons it was not a topic. They, th there was not commitment made to the water infrastructure being properly developed at that time for his re-election. Again, maybe sometimes there's some initiative, but it's not easy for the UNA. Uh, like, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but you know, uh, like, because I, I, this is what I heard from them, that it's not easy to work inside Jerusalem. It's complicated, and 
sometimes they are giving pro bono legal aid, but really to work there and to give some some uh, services, it's kind of 